carp, pigs, pythons. What do all these animals have in common? Well, take your time thinking about it and we'll get started. America has its fair share of invasive species, each with its vulnerabilities. Take kudzu, for instance. It's a plant that can't handle cold. Asian carp can't survive in salt water. As for pythons, they aren't great at covering long distances quickly. But out of all these creatures, pigs seem to be the only ones without any noticeable weaknesses. You know that video where we talked about how in Australia, rabbits used to be the biggest invasive challenge for a while? These days, cane toads are causing most of the problems, but that's not the point here. Well, in the case of America, their ultimate invasive boss is the feral pig. There are five reasons why. Reason number one, feral pigs have few natural predators in America, which means no one is keeping their population in check. Reason number two, like domestic pigs, feral pigs are quick learners. This means that traps set by humans only work against them at first. Soon the pigs learn to avoid them and do so very successfully. Just to give you an idea, you can fool the deer 50% of the time, but the pigs won't fall for the trap 90% of the time. Reason number three, you can't build fences to keep them away. This is a method that works against rabbits in Australia, but it's useless against pigs because they know how to dig, and they're quite good at it. Reason number four, pigs thrive in almost any environment, climate, or ecosystem. These guys aren't too picky. Last but not least, reason number five, sows begin breeding at around six to eight months old and have two litters of four to eight piglets every 12 to 15 months throughout their lives. Considering they live for four to eight years and have eight piglets in each litter, it's no surprise we end up with a whole pig army. Even a pig population reduced by 70% recovers within two to three years. So how can anyone fight that? We have actual estimates by the scientists. To wipe out pigs, their population would have to decrease by 60 to 80% each year. However, recreational hunters can only handle around a 24% reduction. And that's considered a good year. Usually it's even less than that. Pigs cause a ton of damage. They feast on farm fields, flower gardens, golf courses, and even landfills, seeing them as a snack bar or an all-you-can-eat buffet. Here's what a normal field looks like after the pigs have walked on it, and that's actually considered slight damage. In their march across the country, pigs not only dig up fields uncontrollably, but also destroy roads with infrastructure. They also spread disease and displace native species from wetlands, riverbanks, grasslands, and forests. Many researchers consider feral pigs to be the most destructive invasive species on the planet. And digging the soil is considered their most destructive behavior. With their snouts and tusks, they act like little bulldozers, plowing through crop, soil, forest floors, and even golf courses. They don't discriminate as long as they can sniff out those delicious grubs and acorns. In certain areas, people can't grow crops anymore because the pigs always end up wrecking them. Farming there's just a waste of money, and it doesn't make a difference what type of crops you try to grow. You go for peanuts? Forget about it, because those pigs will have them for lunch. You switch to corn thinking it'd be different? The pigs don't care. They'll chomp it all down just the same. And then you thought inedible cotton could do the trick, but no way. Pigs found a way to mess that up too, digging up the soil for that tasty fertilizer salt. Humans just can't find a crop those pigs won't get their snouts into. Aside from destroying fields, they can introduce harmful bacteria into the water through their feces, chew the roots of tree seedlings, but the damage from pigs goes beyond that. Pigs have been known to prey on lambs and calves. I'm serious. Wild animals suffer too. Pigs prey on deer and endangered salamanders. They raid the clutches of ground-nesting birds, threaten sea turtles. They outcompete deer and wild turkeys for resources and might even scare away coyotes, the local scavengers, to feast on the carcasses by themselves. In Louisiana, feral hogs are ruining levees, destroying crawfish ponds, eating alligator eggs, and digging up coastal wetland plants, causing the ocean to erode the land. And in 2019, feral hogs even killed a man. He was just walking to work when he was attacked by the hog family. In fact, it's worth saying that pigs are not only good at breeding and destroying everything in their path, but also at taking over new territories. Throughout the centuries, this adaptable omnivorous animal has made its way from Florida to Kansas, spread through Texas and California, and lately it's been attempting to move into the northern border of Montana, 
There are currently somewhere between 6 to 9 million wild pigs spread across at least 42 states and 3 territories in the U.S. It's hard to pin down the exact number, but these animals are causing damage that likely amounts to roughly $2.5 billion each year. Naturally, people have not given up trying to resist the takeover. Landowners, sport hunting enthusiasts, and officials use a variety of technologies and weapons to mitigate the damage coming from hogs. But despite grenade launchers and assault rifles, remote-controlled traps, and illegal poisons, the animals resist. These ditches aren't doing much to help, even though with a bit more effort they could be turned into great defense for a castle or something. You wouldn't believe how efficient Americans are at taking down pigs. In many states, wildlife agencies have announced open season, which means there are no specific hunting seasons, no limits on how many pigs you can shoot. People are shelling out millions on guns, ammo, gear, permits, and travel expenses. But guess what? It hasn't made things any better. The hogs have gotten clever and are now only active during the night, so you gotta fork out more cash for night vision devices. And as I mentioned before, the populations of these animals are recovering way too fast. But how did this invasion begin in the first place? Pigs couldn't have just appeared out of thin air and swarmed the continent. It's worth saying that no wild pig or any other member of the pig family, which includes both warthogs and domestic pigs, is native to the Western Hemisphere. They all have ancestors from Southeast Asia, which people have been bringing to North America for centuries to breed and eat. Back in 1493, Christopher Columbus brought domestic pigs to the West Indies to feed his crew. However, those pigs multiplied so rapidly that within a mere 12 years, the Spanish authorities had to issue an order to reduce their population. Since then, pigs have been imported many more times, kept for themselves, and sold to the natives. Domestic pigs have frequently broken free and mated with wild animals, and this has been going on for centuries. As a result, wild pigs in America have turned into a diverse bunch, and their population just keeps on increasing. Surprisingly, pigs are the only animals whose populations are on the rise due to hunting. Here's a simple illustration. When certain states introduced special hunting seasons or bounty rewards in response to a new surge of wild hogs, those creatures couldn't care less. In fact, their population began to increase, defying all logical explanations. How's this possible? Well, people intentionally brought in and bred pigs to make more money off them. So back in 1999, you'd only find them in 11 counties. But once unlimited hunting was allowed, the hog population exploded. By 2010, hogs had spread to a staggering 70 counties. But then how can the problem be solved? I mean, is it even possible? According to experts, there are very few instances where wildlife control through killing has proven successful. We need to use non-lethal means in combination with trapping and shooting, and all this should be done by qualified specialists, not by anyone who wants to try. The eradication of invasive species should be a long-term program, not some sort of sports where people also get paid for. But why not start hunting pigs for culinary purposes? Well, that is to use these animals as a source of meat. Well, that's at the very least just outright dangerous. There are over 24 diseases that people can contract from wild pigs, and you don't necessarily have to eat poorly cooked meat. Some diseases can be contracted simply by cutting up the carcass. The meat from males has such a distinct flavor that it's impossible to stomach. How do you know that? But the most important thing is the money side of it all, which we touched upon earlier. Slaughtering wild animals in large numbers and then transporting the carcasses is really hard, time-consuming, and just not profitable. You'd require powerful reefers and a whole bunch of workers, but in the end, they'd all be operating at a loss. So pigs win again. And guess what? Pigs aren't North America's only invasive problem. Another animal threatens to devastate the fishing industry and forever change the continent's lakes and rivers. You'd actually need a protective helmet to catch it, even though it's not a scary predator with giant claws and teeth. It's just an Asian carp. <coughs> Several species of imported carp escaped into the wild a couple of decades ago and have since spread to rivers and lakes throughout the states. Environmental experts say that in time, small problems with an invasive species have turned into an escalating biological disaster, and there's little humans can do about it. It all started with Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which focused on the pollution of the planet. After its publication, Americans began to actively consider carp as a cleanup crew. The fish was praised for its ability to devour large amounts of algae and pond waste, 
These fish were even used to eat human feces from catch basins. Um, nom, 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 nom. So the not yet invasive carp was introduced to the United States in the 1960s and 1970s for a perfectly benign purpose. But naturally, stuff happened. Sometimes the fish broke free, like during floods when water levels rose high enough to let them swim out of the farms. Can you guess what happened next? These carp were brought in hoping that their appetite would help deal with the pollution. But these fish also had a knack for multiplying like crazy. Some carp species could weigh as much as 100 pounds and devour plankton like there's no tomorrow, munching on 5 to 10 percent of their body weight in a day. The reason is a poorly developed stomach. It's inefficient at breaking down food and getting nutrients, so carp have to eat more to get enough. Since they consume such a huge amount of plankton, other aquatic creatures don't have enough food, which means the whole balance starts to break down. Carp also have few natural predators. The high growth rate and large size simply deter most enemies. By the time the carp reaches a size of about 12 inches, it's too big to be eaten by some important predator species in the reservoir. Now imagine, a single female big head carp, a species in the carp family, can lay up to 1.9 million eggs in a single year. This small vial contains about 3,000 baby Asian carp, and this number was obtained in just one pull of a plankton net. And in this vial, there are fry of native fish species from the same pull. There are about 100 of them. Feel the difference? While it's likely that only 1-3% to of these eggs will grow to become adult fish, that's still more than all other species, which means carp must be dealt with. Carp are regularly corralled into special pens so that they can be caught by nets. A special sound is used to separate invasive carp from other fish. These activities begin every fall when water temperatures drop to 44 degrees Fahrenheit and below. This is because it's almost impossible to catch invasive carp in the summer. They're known for their ability to jump out of the water up to 10 feet high. Whee! So the fish are too active during the warm season. Cold water, in turn, slows them down a lot. Well, people surely built some barriers. Yes, to keep fish away. They put up three of them. This is considered a part of a multi-level line of defense for Lake Michigan. There are plans, by the way, to build a fourth barrier, just to be sure. But despite their best efforts, people still can't win this fight. The De Plains area, known as the Dresden Pool, has seen a 97% decline in these fish since 2012. Is that good news? Not really. It takes about two weeks for the fish to sneak back to where they were all caught and start reproducing. So why not start eating those fish? Well, companies are trying to tap into new markets. Cart meat's already used for everything from fertilizer to pet food. It's not likely that we can get much meat from carp since they're packed with bones, making it hard to get sizable meat portions. So the easiest option is to use minced meat instead. Experts say you can use it instead of beef to make things like fish cutlets and sausages. But yeah, you'll still have to deal with the bones, and most people aren't keen on that, so carp isn't really cut out for mass consumption. In the 1980s, the tale of another invasive species began down in the South Florida Everglades. That's where Burmese pythons first appeared. These massive snakes can grow over 20 feet long and be as thick as telephone poles. They practically wiped out the local population of small and medium-sized mammals, and nobody knows how many of these pythons are crawling in the reserve today. I'll admit that looking at this area, you begin to understand why finding pythons is so difficult. Native to Southeast Asia, these pythons were first introduced to the United States as exotic pets. But when your pet eventually grows this big, you can't help thinking you should release it into the wild, as many people did. Most of the blame, however, lies with Hurricane Andrew. In August 1992, this storm destroyed a python breeding facility and countless snakes got into the nearby swamps. The invasive snakes really loved it there, since female pythons can lay from 50 eggs a year. Plus, there are no natural predators who'd hunt pythons in the region. Their population continues to grow. The reserve is also warm, wet, muddy, and full of prey who have no idea how to deal with unfamiliar snakes. All that's left for the prey is to die out. According to one study, between 1997 and 2012, the region's raccoon, possum, and bobcat populations declined by 99.3%, 98.9%, and 87.5%, respectively. 
Rabbits and foxes were hit even harder, with their populations virtually disappearing. In 2010, the state took action and banned people from owning Burmese pythons as pets. They even hired hunters to help out. The program to get rid of the snakes managed to remove almost 4,000 of them from the wild, but that's just a drop in the ocean. Catching the snakes has been a slow process because they're not easy to spot or capture. Plus, figuring out what to do with them remains a challenge. While python skins can be sold, what do we do with the meat? It's not recommended to eat it, as some pythons in the Everglades contain high levels of mercury. Python records. Eggs. In Florida, having just 50 Burmese python eggs in an ecosystem where they aren't welcome is bad news. But guess what? This female python broke the record with a whopping 96 eggs. People first noticed it back in May when it laid a clutch of eggs that seemed unusually large. However, they could only count the eggs shortly before they hatched due to how they were incubated. This is terrible news for the local animals. If all pythons start breeding so profusely, soon there won't be anyone left in Florida except for them. Python records. Size. In July 2023, a hunter set a record for catching the longest Burmese python in Florida. He caught the giant snake 19 feet long. And it must be said that it was not easy because these pythons are quite aggressive. However, although it's the longest snake killed in Florida so far, it's not the heaviest. The snake weighed 125 pounds, but the title of the heaviest python ever caught belongs to a female caught last year. It weighed 215 pounds. Antarctica is no longer safe. You may think that the only place safe from invasive species is Antarctica. Well, who in their right mind would move there? After all, most of the continent is permanently covered in ice. Not what you'd call comfortable conditions. But a small part of the land does thaw in the warm months, and this thawing allows plants, animals, and other organisms to thrive. Except that this rich biosphere is now under threat. Like everywhere else on the planet, it's getting warmer, which means invasive species adapted only to warmth will get there too. And this goes not only for animals, but also for various algae, fungi, and plants. All of them are invasive too, and they bring a lot of problems along with them. Nowadays, anyone who visits Antarctica is required to wash their feet before stepping ashore, ensuring they don't bring any living creatures along on their soles. See you later!